All right, take it away. Thank you very much, Dan, and thanks for coming to the Crash Course, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Carl Zimmering. I've been teaching here at Pratt since fall of 2012, uh, coordinating the Sustainability Studies minor. Before that, I was at Roosevelt University in Chicago, uh, where I co-founded the Sustainability Studies major. I say all this because that's context for my talk today. Um, what I want to do is give a little taste of how I teach a class and design a class as it relates to field experiences and partnerships with relevant community groups uh, for those field um, experiences. Um, so when I first started developing a sustainability studies curriculum at Roosevelt in Chicago in 2008, I partnered with a um, colleague of mine, Mike Bryson, and we team taught a class called the Sustainable City uh, to see what kinds of themes uh, and uh, that we'd want to teach in a class. And we organized the class. It's a little small on the board, but in the middle of that um, checkbox are several uh, green things. And the green things are field experiences. And we organized the schedule of this course around field trip experiences. Um, Roosevelt is in downtown Chicago, and we realized there were a lot of uh, issues in the urban environment that were a fairly quick ride, walk, or um, um, automobile ride away from the campus in the South Loop. One of the places that we thought would be a good thing to study was the Chicago River, and in particular, the South Branch of the Chicago River, which you can see this is a map of the west and south side of Chicago. And the Chicago River goes straight down from the city center and then west towards suburban Stickney, where the world's largest wastewater treatment uh, plant is found to process all the sewage. But if you look at the A on this Google map, uh, part of the Chicago River turns dead south under the Stevenson Expressway and peters out into a small little um, fork that is nicknamed Bubbly Creek. Bubbly Creek is about two miles long, and it ends just north of West Pershing Road. Um, and where it ends is where Chicago's stockyards um, were um, headquartered for about 130 years. This is a picture of the stockyards in 1941. Um, every day for over a century, roughly 70,000 animals, pigs, cows, chickens, were slaughtered. Um, and that meat was the central uh, distribution uh, and production point for the United States' meat industry. Philip Armour, one of the meat packers, used to brag that his plant used, quote, every part of the pig but the squeal. So whether you've got your ham or you have your hot dog, it's made up just about every bit of the pig. And so Armour used to brag, we don't waste much of the pig. That said, even with uh, lots of processed meats using hooves, hair, teeth, what have you. Um, waste materials did get generated from the slaughtering process, and those waste materials were dumped in Bubbly Creek. To the point that Bubbly Creek today is actually shorter than it was in 1850 when the meatpacking operations started. Um, the reason for that is with the wastes of 70,000 animals each and every day going into the creek, um, portions of the creek solidified, and some of this is evident from this picture. In the middle of this rather dark picture, you see a chicken standing on the waste in the middle of the creek. The Chicago Daily News decided to take this photo in 1911. Here's our friend, the chicken, um, who's probably standing on a number of his friends, the chickens. <laughs> And this was part of an expose about how environmentally polluted this waterway was. If this was not a dramatic enough um, image for readers, the uh, cameraman decided to have his friend come out and stand on it as well. So we have a man walking on the water here. This is not, and there's no ice at this point. That's all solid waste from animal uh, leavings. And Bubbly Creek uh, became internationally famous in 1904 when Upton Sinclair in his expose of the meatpacking district called it Chicago's Great Open Sewer. Not only were animal leavings uh, 
dumped in here, but also a lot of uh, human excrement came into this through the sewer system. One of the difficulties of Bubbly Creek is because it ends in a ter ter um, terminus and the current goes south, this would basically just fester and um, build up in the southern terminus, and the current is very, very weak there even today. The last slaughterhouse closed in Chicago in 1971, so the generation of this magnitude of waste essentially stopped. And largely what happened is if you're not a historian or an immediate neighbor, Bubbly Creek kind of became forgotten. Um, even though it's very close to downtown Chicago, and in fact, two of the major transportation systems run directly over it. This is a picture I took from the Orange Line Ashland CTA stop. Um, the creek is right below that, and what you see next to it is the Stevenson Expressway with a lot of traffic. Thousands of drivers go over Bubbly Creek every day without even knowing it. At Roosevelt University, a primarily commuter college, a lot of our students drive the Stevenson, and when we eventually came down to Bubbly Creek, a lot of them remarked to me that they drive over it every day and never knew it existed. So it's largely a forgotten part of the Chicago River, and the Chicago River itself has seen a lot of environmental impact over the last century or so. Wastewater is dumped into it regularly without being treated, and it's mostly been used for industry uh, since the city was founded in 1838. In 1979, a Chicago journalist uh, called Bubbly Creek, I mean not Bubbly Creek, the entire Chicago River, our friendless river, and because of that, a group of environmentalists called Friends of the Chicago River decided, well, this river needs some friends, so we're going to organize um, this organization in order to promote the use of the river as a natural waterway and as a recreational area. It's not just a sink for waste. It's not just a, thorough, a thoroughfare for industry. It's uh, part of our natural environment and something that we should be promoting as such. And one of the things Friends of the Chicago River does is they uh, have uh, several boathouses, they have a lot of canoes, and they have a lot of trained guides and safety experts to promote use of the waterway. And when Mike Bryson and I were creating the Sustainable City course, we uh, contacted them to see if they could take 27 students, a few faculty members, one faculty member's son, out on the Bubbly Creek stretch of the river. And Friends of the Chicago River usually go on the north side around Goose Island, maybe downtown. Um, they don't usually get requests to canoe the most polluted part of the Chicago River. Um, but they thought, that sounds like a great idea. So in May of 2009, uh, we coordinated a few cars and some uh, train rides, and the class met down at Bubbly Creek. And here's a picture of the Friends of the Chicago River, are the guides in the orange hats, along with the various people from the class. And what we did is we signed, uh, we all signed waivers in case we fell into this polluted water, we would not be suing um, Friends of the Chicago River. Uh, and we also paid them a fee. Uh, this was a total for the entire group of $800, uh, which was mostly covered by the Department of uh, Professional Studies, um, whose chair was Brad Hunt, who took this photograph. In exchange for that, we got about a half hour um, safety demonstration, which is the fairly standard safety uh, demonstration that you'll get if you go into a rafting or canoe trip, with the added caveat that this is a polluted body of water. So if um, once you get out, wash your hands, take a shower, and if your canoe capsizes, take a shower and do laundry very quickly. <laughs> um, so after about a half an hour of training, by the way, most of the students had never been in a canoe in their lives. A lot of these are adults, working class, urban population who um, just would not have had that experience before. So in addition to uh, looking at this very flooded waterway, this was an introduction to a form of transportation for them. Because of that and the fact that we had about 30 people total, it took us a while to get in. This is the launch site at the north end of Bubbly Creek. You can see the Sears, well, I call it the Sears Tower, it's now called Willis Tower in the background. Uh, this took probably about 15, 20 months to get everyone in the water, and then we slowly made our way south. 
And as we did, uh, the students were able to get an idea of the creek well beyond what Mike and I could prepare them in lecture and through excerpts of, say, reading The Jungle. One of the things that they noticed was that the banks of, Bub of uh, Bubbly Creek are essentially man-made, mostly concrete or metal, um, indicating how much this is an, was an industrialized waterway. This is not unusual for large stretches of the Chicago River. As I mentioned, most of the uh, students had not canoed before, but they seemed uh, like Gabe here to enjoy it very much. Um, while most of the waterway that is concrete or metal, some of it is vegetated. And one of the reasons Friends of the Chicago River wanted to work with us is they're recruiting volunteers to try to help restore the riparian zone. Um, and so having all of these newcomers to the river look to see there is actually nature thriving in this highly polluted place uh, was an introduction for them to get volunteers. And since that was very much um, congruent with our goals as sustainability faculty, this was a fairly easy partnership to make. In addition to vegetation, we also saw a lot of wildlife, including blue herons and a bunch of geese um, who are just everywhere in Chicago. Oh, what the heck did I do here? <laughs> Sorry for any uh, seizures I may have uh, given you there. Um, I have a few slides here. And sorry to everyone watching this at home. Um, while there is wildlife, there's also a lot of waste. We could see a lot of plastic floating in the water. There's also plastic bags right here on this tree. Because Bubbly Creek is essentially something that people ignore, don't see, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. It invites use as a dump, so people um, from the street overhead often will throw tires or bags or containers into the waterway. For a long time, this was a very working class area because, frankly, it smelled horrible. You can still smell aspects of the waste in Bubbly Creek. I'll get to that in a second. But because it's so close to downtown Chicago, one of the things that I didn't realize until uh, doing this trip is as you paddle through this two-mile stretch, you see some brand new townhouses. This area is starting to gentrify despite the fact it's next to the great open sewer. Um, and this uh, picture was taken probably about 700 feet from the southern terminus of the creek. Um, southern terminus of the creek, again, entirely concrete and metal. This is somewhat dark, but you can see the white aspect, the white bits in the water, those are bubbles coming out of the creek. So Bubbly Creek is still bubbling. What's causing the bubbling is organic matter decaying and new combined sewage overflow adding to that organic matter. The last slaughterhouse closed in 1971. This picture was taken 38 years later, so even though that mass industrial waste isn't going into the water, Bubbly Creek is still bubbling. And um, as students observed when we were down here for about 20 minutes, it smells extremely foul. Um, another thing that's uh, interesting is if you start to dig your paddle in, it kind of is like you're going through pudding in this part. Josh, I'm sorry. This is right after breakfast, too. Um, again, one of the reasons for the bubbles continue to stay up is that um, sewage is going through, and the Racine Avenue pumping station is about 30 yards north of the southern terminus, and when there are storms, combined sewer overflow gushes in, and that's why it may be a little hard to see on the concrete embankment. It says, danger, do not dock here. So we docked there, <laughs> and we thought this was a really good time to raft up and talk with our guides. Um, the guides and Mike and myself uh, talked about the history of this and the current use of this as a sink for human wastes. Um, this lasted about 15 minutes, after which we eventually moved up. It was a nice sunny day, which was good, because had it been raining, those giant pumps would have been gushing out sewage at us, and we would not have wanted to be in the area. So we um, made our way north again. It's only a two-mile stretch. And we uh, got out of the boats. And at this point, we did a number of uh, water 
quality tests. Um, we uh, looked to see how transparent the water was, and we took a lot of samples that we then brought to la a lab. And over the next two weeks, we got reports back from the lab on what was in the water. The good news about Bubbly Creek is that really toxic um, things such as heavy metals were not found in significant quality in the water we were testing at the dock site. But fecal coliforms, which eat fecal matter, were hundreds of times higher than the safe limit for swimming or boating. Thus, the waivers we had with um, friends of the Chicago River. We then discussed our findings in class uh, the next week. And again, students found this a very useful way to augment their readings and our class discussions. And since this initial 2009 foray, one class or another has gone out on Bubbly Creek with friends of the Chicago River every semester at Roosevelt. Um, or so I'm told at this point, because of course I left Roosevelt in 2012 to come here and help found the sustainability studies minor. One of the classes that I teach here is called Production, Consumption, and Waste. Um, actually, Dan, who introduced me, was one of the students in this last year, and so he can tell you a little bit more about this class if you're curious. And this is an elective in the minor, um, and we had about 15 students last fall. And we combined course discussion with individual research papers and a couple of field trips. One was to Newtown Creek's wastewater um, treatment facility as well, but the other was to the Gowanus Canal. Gowanus Canal actually has a lot in common with Budley Creek. It's only not even quite two miles. It's a highly industrialized urban waterway. It was dredged in the middle of the 19th century, the same time the slaughterhouses uh, uh, were founded in Chicago. And it was crucial to the industrial development, not just the industrial development, but the development of Brooklyn. A lot of the brownstone used to make our um, brownstone houses came through the Gowanus Canal. And after three decades of discussion, the EPA designated the Gowanus Canal a Superfund site in 2010. The reason for that is the industrial heritage. This is a picture from 1928. Um, the Gowanus Canal has had a lot of industrial activity on its banks, including tanneries making leather, manufactured gas industry, asphalt, chemical fertilizer, and of course, lots and lots of shipping. Um, as industry worked alongside the canal, it also dumped wastes into the canal, including PCBs and heavy metals such as lead. And that's the reason why this is a Superfund site. It's not the only reason we should be concerned about the environment in the Gowanus Canal. Again, I'm sorry this is right after breakfast, but sewage combines overflow, sewage overflow comes into the canal as well. Just like with Bubbly Creek, if you dig down with your paddle, you come up with sewage. Um, and the dumping of combined sewage overflow and the industrial wastes in some parts a century ago made this almost completely solid. Uh, like Bubbly Creek, this is a waterway in a highly populated zone, and this is a picture from the MTA 4th Street Station that I took. It's a bit more visible than uh, Bubbly Creek. And like um, the Chicago River, the Gowanus Canal has been the subject of some activists attempting to reclaim this and give us some stewardship over the environmental quality. The Gowanus Dredgers Canoe Club was founded in 1999, much like Friends of the Chicago River. They want to um, really show how this can be a recreational and environmentally uh, relevant area. So they like to educate people with tours of the canals and also bring people out in their own canoes to have fun on the canal. Because if people are having fun nearby, people may care about it. They provide these boats for tours, and they even have races occasionally, which I believe are the only races on a Superfund site, <laughs> uh, though I might be wrong about that. We have a lot of Superfund sites around the country. Um, this is a, a picture of the launch site at 2nd Avenue near Bond Street. Uh, much like Bubbly Creek, this is near residential areas that in the recent past have gentrified considerably, um, reflecting the goals of the Gowanus Dredgers uh, Canoe Club to use the area's recreation. They've got a boathouse and 
a sign that welcomes you to Brooklyn's coolest super fund site. Uh, this is the only kind of happy super fund uh, sign I've ever seen, and I work with uh, contaminated areas quite a bit. This is the fun sign, the less fun sign from the New York City um, Department of Environmental Protection warns you that only experienced boaters should go on this. There are hazardous materials in here. This is a super fun site. Please don't swim in the canal. If you'd like to know more, there's information online about what nasty stuff is in here. Uh, so with those caveats, I, I think we responsibly warned all our students not to fall into the canal. We haven't been sued. We signed waivers. Um, again, much like um, uh, Friends of the Chicago River, we worked. Uh, we, there was a fee that we gave to um, the dredgers. And so then we went out on the water. They gave us safety equipment. If you'd like to contact Gowanus dredgers, their phone number is on the back of Wilson Chang's back. And we went out on a nice sunny day to see what we could see on the canal. And what we could see is, again, a lot of the ways in which humankind has transformed nature. Uh, much like Bubbly Creek, uh, uh, we've got a lot of concrete and metal embankments, a lot of industry, but also a lot of vegetation and wildlife. Um, it's a very interesting confluence of users of the water. And again, a fair amount of trash in there. Uh, several industries are still active alongside the canal, including a scrapyard there on the left-hand side of the screen and an asphalt plant, which is just huge. And this is something that you can smell fairly uh, easily if you're going down through the canal. We did not do the entire canal because I was a little nervous about getting to the uh, mouth of it to, uh, down into the bay. But we passed through a lot of the residential areas and actually passed under a couple of bridges. And much like Bubbly Creek, this is not that huge. Um, there are a lot of people who go over the creek without even noticing it on foot or on automobile every day. Um, in this class, uh, students had to do an individualized research papers. We did a lot of work on looking at the air, the land, and the water as sinks for waste and what the consequences are. And so, this, like the Bubbly Creek trip for its sustainable city, gave students a very hands-on look at what the consequences of industrial waste were in a waterway. And um, this also fit the Gowanus dredgers' mission because the Gowanus dredgers wanted people to recreate and enjoy themselves on the waterway, and I sense that we fulfilled their goals based on this picture. Um, a lot of people were involved with making sure these trips were possible. Just briefly, I want to go through them. Uh, Mike Bryson, who um, founded the Sustainability uh, Studies major at Roosevelt with me, suggested we can do Bubbly Creek. We got in contact with Kim Bevan of the Friends of the Chicago River. Uh, made arrangements with her, and she was one of our guides out on the creek. Brad Hunt provided the finances to make uh, that trip possible. He also uh, went out on the water and took a lot of photographs <coughs> along with his seven-year-old son. Uh, Mike's wife, Laura, took several of the photographs that you saw here. In, at Roosevelt, um, the, bubbly, uh, the uh, Gwyneth Canal trip was made possible because of uh, donation Greg Horwitz, my chair in um, social science and cultural studies, uh, made to Gowanus Dredgers. Owen Foote of Gowanus Dredgers was our point person. Uh, he's the treasurer of the group, a very enthusiastic person, and made it possible for us to do all of this. And my major role was not falling into either waterway while doing this coordination. Goodness, it's 9.55. I've managed to come in under time, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. I have a question around why it takes 30 years to designate a clearly polluted area on the Superfund site, and then also what exactly Superfund designation means in terms of the possible turnaround. Okay, we have five minutes. <laughs> Superfund was uh, established in December of 1980. It basically makes industry potentially liable for the cleanup of their hazardous wastes. In general, this sounds like it's a really good policy that will finally clean up everything. In practice, not just in Brooklyn, but in general, it's usually a years-long process to designate a site, much less establish who is responsible. 
that's one of the problems in Brooklyn. The other was we have hundreds of eligible sites around the country. Where do we start? Who is going to argue to make this a super fun site? And what the uh, momentum for doing that in Brooklyn increased in the late 90s and in the first decade of the 21st century. And so finally in 2010, this happened. There, we could talk a little bit about eras when Superfund designation was kind of lax, like the entire 1980s and the Bush administration, but that has something to do with it. Uh, but briefly for the Gowanus Canal, a lot of people in the neighborhood want this cleaned up, and that has a big part of it being designated a Superfund site now. In terms of the actual cleanup, the major problems at the Gowanus Canal, much like Bubbly Creek, is the stuff on the bottom, PCBs and mercury. That's going to be a decades-long cleanup. So that's not <coughs> happening this year or next. They're planning it right now. So this is a very time-intensive um, process. And again, don't swim the Gowanus Canal anytime over the next 10 years. I was going to ask you about um, the fact that Whole Foods is, you know, I know they did a lot of remediation to be able to, you know, to do it. But what do you think about the fact that we have a food chain right there on the Gowanus Canal? Yeah. Well, I mean, some of this has to do with we have a gentrified area in mm -hmm. the Gowanus Canal, too. People yeah. are willing to live near these highly polluted sites because, well, why, does, why would anyone live in Gowanus? It's an easy shot into Manhattan, and there's a lot of cool things to do. It's next to Park Slope, one of the toniest areas of Brooklyn. So it's fascinating that because of location, people are willing to live near these highly toxic areas, and if people are willing to live near there, they want amenities like Whole Foods. So it's a very interesting tension that we have between people wanting the convenience and then being disgusted by the, what we've done with the heritage of the area for over a century. And so we have to come to terms with what we've done to the waterway, and that's, again, informing the Superfund designation. But the people who've moved into Park Slope and Gwyneth right now, um, their kids are going to be well out of college and having kids of their own before that's cleaned up. So it's, that's an uneasy tension. But do you think there were any environmental effects? Yeah. Um, I mean, the fact that, I mean, I know what, in terms, of, in terms of the food at Whole Foods, I wouldn't worry too much. Uh, one of my colleagues here, Damon Chalky, has actually done some testing of soil after Hurricane Sandy when the Gowanus Canal flooded into the nearby areas oh, right. and did soil testing to see how much pollution there was. And there are some concerns, I'll say. So that's one thing to worry about if you're there. When you take your students out on these polluted waterways, do you, um, or the people organizing that are part of the boat clubs, look at whether it's rained in the past few days, or is it just something that's scheduled? To um, we do schedule them, but if conditions are inclement, we schedule backup times. And happily, well, actually, the um, the Gowanus trip, we rescheduled because the G train wasn't running. That was stranded <laughs> on campus. Um, but, as you can see, we had fantastic weather for both of these. Uh, one of the things I've tried to do, though, is put in these safety times in case it had been raining and it's not feasible to be on the, the well, canal. That's not necessarily the question I was oh. like, I understand you don't want to be outside doing outdoor. Oh, even when it's raining, though, but if the, raining, but, um, if the, the sewage the, is too the, bad, the, we do, the, too. The two or three days after a rain event is when the combined sewage overflow actually kicks in. Yeah. And that's when the key people call it form and all the other mm -hmm. toxic counts skyrocket. Yes. And it's really not a good idea, even if you don't plan on falling in the water, yeah. to be in contact with or, or that close of contact. And the point I was making is even for that, we would not be going in. Okay. Um, so whether it's raining that day or earlier that week, we would not go in. And happily, we managed to do this in ways that uh, it was as responsible as one could be. Okay, I have two questions. One is, is there any connection to the groundwater? Um, in the Gowanus Canal, um, I think if there is, it's minimal, but I'm not entirely certain. In terms of Bubbly Creek, the answer is at this point effectively no, because there, I know there's so much sediment trapped between the waterway and anything below. Um, so that's the short and incomplete answer for that. Right. The other thing is, if 
Superfund designates that the industry is responsible for, you know, who do you go to with the Kiwanis Canal? I mean, a lot of those That's places are defunct. That's a fantastic question. And the answer is we're not entirely certain. One of the ways in which Superfund's responsibility has been attempted in the past is if a company goes out of business or goes bankrupt, a holding company may have taken it over. It's historically been the case that the EPA has tried to go after the holding company. And sometimes that's kind of tricky because suppose the holding company took over the company in 1965. The pollution was in 1945. Superfund starts in 1980. You're going to make someone liable for something that happened after all of this? That's been a big point of contention with Superfund um, implementation. And that's one of the reasons this takes such a long time. Finding the potentially responsible party, establishing who should have responsibility, is a very tricky situation, especially with these small businesses. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why 15, 20 years from now, this will probably still be a polluted waterway. For both bodies of water, any evidence of fish? Um, yes. Not only is there any evidence of fish, but I did not see this at our trip on the Gowanus Canal, but I've seen it at other times at the Gowanus Canal, and one of the pictures I did not show you of Bubbly Creek are of people fishing in the water, which is a very bad idea just because of the mercury and lead alone. Um, fish are there, and in fact, the reason why there were so many geese at Bubbly Creek is they were fishing in the water for these highly polluted fish, uh, mostly white fish in, um, in Bubbly Creek. So yes, it's still, despite the pollution, an active ecosystem and habitat. Yeah. So going back to the Gowanus Canal, you were saying that it's just been, I guess I walk by there and work around there enough and I don't see really anything going on. Is that because they're still working on the legal details and then there's a lot of planning that's required just to start the dredging yeah. process? Um, yes, and it's only been, and this sounds like it's only been four years since the hearings led to it being a Superfund site. I don't think there's going to be actual dredging going on there for at least three or four years. And this is only a 1.8 mile waterway. This is a very small waterway. This is how much time is required to get it done. So yeah, don't hold your breath on seeing anything anytime soon. I would guess it's going to be at least a couple more years. So that's the legal part of the plan? Uh, well, they're combined, of course. You, you can't separate them. Um, in fact, part of what happened in 2020, did you go to any of the meetings in 2010 for the, for the plan? Is if this is going to be a Superfund site, what plan do we have? Do we dredge the bottom? Uh, do we just leave it there and put concrete over it? Seal it like we would with a brownfield site? Or do we remove the soil that's contaminated? The plan that came out is to remove the soil that's contaminated. But is that, no, that's is that what GE's doing? Wait, what GE's doing? Yes. When yes, when this is done, it's then put into a form of a landfill on land with a plastic liner. Um, we have a number of hazardous waste landfills where we do that around the country. That's also an imperfect place to site this. One of the points of the waste class is there is no true out of sight, out of mind. There's always a consequence for our wastes, and. Where is that polluted soil going to go? Who lives next to it? Those are questions that need to be answered. So knowing that they decided to dredge, and knowing that that's an imperfect system, do you think there's other ways of dealing with this other than capping it? Is there some sort of fire remediation method that could be used for this sort of very intense industrial pollution? The tricky thing about bioremediation is bioremediation of what? Because there are multiple contaminants in here. For example, with petroleum, there are there is aquatic life that could eat petroleum, right. but could it eat petroleum, PCBs, lead, and mercury? Mm -hmm. That's the tricky bit. And I'm not sure if such a multivalent uh, consumer exists. Uh, the other question is, would it be cost effective to do that rather than seal it off either where it is now or in a landfill someplace else? My suspicion is for particularly the Gowanus Canal, it's going to be easier, and I use the word easier in huge quotation marks, to remove the soil. When you talk about aquatic life, uh, what, what are we talking about here as far as eating? 
these, these waste products? Oh, um, there are, say, bacteria that can eat petroleum. And one of the things we found since the BP Deepwater Horizon spill is that a few populations of aquatic life have thrived because there's all this food there. Now, of course, it's killed pelicans and lots of fish and shrimp. But, um, and actually, Chris Jensen, uh, one of my colleagues in math and science, is particularly good for talking about this. Niches will come in if suddenly there's a food source for them. Um, but that's a small minority of aquatic life. Uh, again, it's generally devastating to the local populations of the fish if you suddenly have all these toxins in there. But I think about the repercussions of when the starts dredging, what's going to happen to the any disposable and building new housing around that area? The, what do these people do these people understand? What's this is one of the reasons Superfund designation took such a long time. There were many public hearings in Gowanus. The conclusion that came up is that the residents want this to get this hazard out of the way. But that's the general conclusion. Heated debate definitely existed in those. But that one of the things the EPA does, I should mention, uh, when designating Superfund sites, and this is a learning curve that they really developed in the early 90s, about a dozen years into the program, is that before designating something a Superfund site, a lot of public hearings take place, and they want to see what the appetite for the immediately affected peoples might be for this. Because, again, this is a long, there are a lot of consequences to this, and maybe getting a mortgage in an area that's got a hazardous waste site on it could be more difficult, or insurance. So these are, these are discussed at the public meetings. I'm actually thinking about the new housing that's supposed to go there, not so much the old housing. If you're going to build new housing in this area, do people know what, you know, do they understand? Well, and if we're going to look at the area where at large, when a large storm comes, this right. isn't just going to flood right. there. It floods Park Slope right. as well. So if you live in Park Slope, I apologize for giving you some anxieties that me and I've had before. Um, and I, again, we're starting to see the flavor of why Superfund is such a complex policy when it was, they never dreamed it would be this complex when they started, but getting rid of this waste can be much more difficult than anyone imagined. Any other, Dan? So in addition to whatever you're doing with the Superfund site and dredging, there are also the issue of storm water. Mm -hmm. So how, how much has been dedicated to that? I mean, I don't know exactly how much you can clean up, let's say, those adjacent neighborhoods and the Guadalajara area. How much you'll, even, you know, if, if you start having near permeable surfaces everywhere and dealing with things mm -hmm. that you might get, you might sewer overflow from other areas. Like, how much has that been addressed in those two cases? Actually, um, in terms of the super fun funding, I don't know, but this is one of the main reasons why going to Stretchers has people out, is to sh discuss the continuing waste legacy of combined sewer overflow, and perhaps get some measures that, I don't know if there's on-point disinfection that could happen. Um, but th there are two, and actually I should mention that this is, of course, part of a system of polluted waterways in New York and Brooklyn, Newtown Creek being another particularly big one, and that's where we have our wastewater treatment facility. There is another organization that does Newtown Creek canoe trips as well, and like Gwyneth Stretchers, a lot of what they talk about is the issues of combined sewer overflow, mostly educating the public about what this is and why it's a health concern. Um, with the long-term goal of maybe developing, uh, again, more sustainable solutions like permeable ground, but it's always going to be a problem, especially in such a densely built area like New York City. We have a lot of concrete here. Water is not going to absorb into the ground. Are you familiar with Harbor Lab? They're, I'm, also, they're also on the new concrete. I don't know them personally. I've heard of them. Yeah, they're, they're actually a nonprofit dedicated to education around the, water, the whole harbor, not just Newtown Creek, um, as opposed to a social club that focuses a lot on, on education. I may be contacting them for the next iteration of this class. Because uh, as I mentioned, we do go up to Newtown Creek as well. Um, I just decided one canoe trip was probably enough for the class. Right. Uh, but thanks for the tip. So how are that? Harbor Lab, Harper Lab, Bernie, and Fincher Cody. Any other questions or comments? In that case, thank you so much, and I'll let the next speaker here. Right.
Absolutely. Absolutely. And have fun with the rest of the day. And yes. by all means, have a conversation with them. Yes. Thank you.